Well, I invite you this morning to open your Bible up to the book of Ephesians, to the book of Ephesians. What a wonderful study it's been for my own heart. I trust yours as well. And we really come to a really a crucial, you know, a crucial section of Scripture in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Certainly one of the beauties of exposition is that we cover passages of Scripture that often you wouldn't cover. And I've had to think as I dive into this crucial section with you that some of you have maybe never heard it exposited out of the Word of God. What's exciting about this part is that one New Testament scholar said of this passage in 2, 11 through 22 that it's perhaps the most significant text on the local church in the entire New Testament. And I would have to agree with that. Now, I remind you that as you turn to Ephesians, we're in that that section of chapters 1 through 3 where Paul just keeps delineating our biblical position in Christ. He's going to do that in 1 through 3. He's going to tell you who you are in Christ. Then when we get to chapter 4 through 6, he's going to deal with our practice in Christ. But before, beloved, we can get to the practice and all the commands that are given to us in 4 through 6, we have to keep delineating what Christ has done for us. And so we come to a crucial section on the unity of the life of Jew and Gentile, how the Gentile came into God's kingdom, and the ramifications for that are profound as we get to chapter 4, but we can't get to chapter 4 before we get to these most critical chapters on our position in Christ. Now, there's much to say in Scripture about the unity and the the ideal of believers dwelling together. But oftentimes, I think you would agree that this practical unity is difficult to come by. And I think this is evident in a humorous, we'll put it this way, story that I read about denominational ties. Obviously, we're non-denominational here, uh, which sometimes is, is a great thing in many ways, and other times denominations are a blessing, but here's how this story went. A man said, I was in San Francisco walking across the Golden State Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge when I saw a guy on the bridge about to jump And I thought I'd try to save him. And so I said to him, don't jump. He said, I guess you're right. So I said, the man said to him, are you a Christian or Jewish or what? And the man that was about to jump said, I'm a a Christian. The man responded and said, well, small world, me too. So he asked him, are you Protestant or Catholic or Greek Orthodox And he said, Protestant. And the man said, me too. He said, what denomination? He said, Baptist. The man said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said that he was Northern Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reformed Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. I said, me too. He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern Region. And he said, Northern Conservative Fundamental Baptist Great Lakes Region. And the man said, me too. He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region of 1912. And the man said, I screamed, die heretic, and I pushed him over the bridge. I mean, we just laugh. If, we've, if you've grown up around any of this stuff, you, you understand the, the nature of that. But oftentimes, as we think about 
unity in the church, it's true. There's differences, is there not? There's things that believers uh, say that are different, that they have different doctrines sometimes. Some of those are on a minor level and some of those are on a major level. But I bring you this morning to chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, on his grand theme of unity, his grand theme of reconciliation. Let me read the text for you, and it will set it up for us this week and the weeks to come. Paul says in 2.11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made us both one and has broken down the... In his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Then it says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What a wonderful text. If if you're wondering where the centerpiece of this is, I I think it's 2.16, that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. He brings reconciliation. Reconciliation obviously speaks of a relationship that goes from hostility to peace between two parties. In fact, look back at verse 14. He himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the, dwell, the dividing wall of hostility. So <clears throat> that is his theme. Chapter 2, at least 11 through 22, deals with that. And particularly, he is explaining how the Gentiles, that's you if you're non-Jewish, who were not part of the old covenant, came to be God's new creation and his new covenant people. Here seems to be the flow of Paul's argument. He was dealing with reconciliation individually in our vertical relationship with God in chapter 2, 1 through 10. In other words, that reconciliation brings peace with God. As we come to 2, 11 through 22, he's dealing with reconciliation not so much vertically, but corporately in our horizontal relationships that we have to each other, which brings harmony. So first he deals with our lostness, if you will, in 2, 1 through 10. And now in 11 through 22, he's going to share the reconciliation that we need to one another. And again, the grand theme of Ephesians is that Jesus Christ has destroyed the alienation that separated men from God and men from each other. Now, obviously, this has huge ramifications for us. This is why your family ought to be unified. This is why your uh, church that we are in ought to be unified because of all that Christ sought to accomplish on our behalf. 
Now, the focal point of our reconciliation, the theological undergirding, really for the entire book of Ephesians, is found in Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. We'll look at that next week. That's where, if you will, believers are brought near both to God and brought near to each other, Gentiles and Jews, through the saving death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here you might be wondering, at least in this text, is verses 11 through 22 gives us a historical biography of what God has done specifically to bring Jew and Gentile together. Now, I remind you, even as you drop into this argument, all of this is a description of the power of God in chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. That power that raised Christ is that power that raised you, both in vertical relationship to him as well as horizontal relationship to each other. And I I just say to you, there's no way that our world is ever going to have harmony. There's no way ever that our world is going to have peace apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. But those who are in Christ ought to know this type of unity, ought to know this type of harmony, ought to know this type of peace. Your home ought to be a place where there's gentleness and love and peace. Elders' meetings ought to be a place that's bent and formed, if you will, on the unity of Jesus Christ on the cross. And by all means, if you're a Gentile here, how did you become part of this wonderful membership and fellowship? What has Christ Jesus done for you to bring about a spirit of thanksgiving? So let me show you where we're going. I, maybe I could have put this on the screen, but in 2, 11 and 12, here as we dive into it, he's going to show us what we were before Christ, okay? Then in 2, 13 through 18, he's going to declare what Christ has done for us on the cross to bring about that positional unity. And then he's going to share in 2, 19 through 22, what we have become united in one body, and that's called the church. So the question as we walk into the text is, how did God do this? I mean, how did God bring unity to Gentiles and Jews and make us one? Obviously, the practical implications are huge because, again, it's going to lead to unity in our church, unity within the family, how do a husband and wife dwell together in unity, All of that is built off our position. Now let me look at this section with you by just identifying three key words, and I think it will help you put a hat, if you will, on what this looks like. First is the word alienation in 2, 11, and 12. Then we'll look at the word reconciliation in 13 through 18, okay? And then we're going to look at a third word, and that third word is is creation in 19 through 22. I'll call it new creation. But that's the flow of where Paul is going. You are alienated. You need to be reconciled. And then thirdly, he put you in a new creation. He puts you in the local church. And that's why when we think of the local church, it's an unbelievable privilege of what God has done for us. So the Gentiles, who were separate from Christ, are now fellow citizens, members of his household, so that together we have become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And again, one scholar, it just struck me, said this is perhaps the most significant text in all of the New Testament on the local church. If, if from my heart to yours, this is why so many churches end up so weak and so immature. Very few are committed to give the position of the believer before they call out the practice of the believer. All that we do by way of practice in four through six comes out of what he has done for us and the thankfulness that should be ours for what he's done. Then out of joy, 
we serve him with gladness. But let's look at that first word, alienation. Alienation. And in fact, look at the text with me. I'll just begin with verse 11. Therefore, remember. It's what he's telling you by the Spirit of God even now. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which was made in the flesh by hands. Now just stop there just for a second. He, he says, therefore, remember. And whenever you see that phrase there in verse 11, you're looking back. And certainly Paul is looking back in his argument and making a connection with 2, 1 through 10, isn't he? In other words, remember the mighty reversal Christ has done on your behalf. Remember that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, working in the sons of disobedience, and we among them were all too children of wrath. Remember who you were, and then remember, but God, rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive. So here, as he begins to open up on the alienation of the Gentiles, he said, you need to remember the condition from which you were rescued, if you will. Now, the word, therefore, and then the word remember is a command, and I think I told you there's only one command in the opening three chapters, and it's right there in verse 11. That's the only thing that he commands you to do. All the other imperatives, 36 of them, come from chapters 4 through 6, which tell you what to do. But he, he begins here, and he says, I want you to call to mind. I want you to remember. Look down in your text. He not only says it in verse 11, therefore remember, but he also says in verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. So continually call to mind, in fact, if anything this morning, you can't be a person who forgets what God has done. And so here Paul calls us back to remember, to deepen our appreciation, to deepen our our gratitude, our gratitude, to magnify God's grace. Remember the battle, if you will, to you Gentiles, that was won to unite two hostile groups, Jew and Gentile, bring them together, but also to, to win back your vertical relationship with God as well. Listen, I would just humbly say to you that nothing infuses our thankfulness to God than a sinner looking back and remembering the pit that you were rescued from. Listen, even this morning, you can't forget that. Some of you weren't even in a saved background from a saved family. You can't, remember, you can't forget that. You have to remember, and that's what Paul's saying. In fact, I won't take the time, but Israel was called to remember the mighty deliverance by God from slavery in Egypt. In fact, Moses said in Exodus 13, remember this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. And there's testimony after testimony where it says they forgot. I hope you haven't forgot. I hope you haven't become so prideful that you or I think we're special in some way. I mean, what would it be like even this morning to come back and Paul says, I want you to remember what he delivered you from. I want you to remember the pit that he pulled you out of. I want to remind you Gentiles that you were not even in God's purview at least at one time. Now you remember as well today and specifically he wants you to remember two things, okay? He wants you to remember that first you were alienated physically, okay? Then secondly, alienated spiritually. But, but look what he says in 2.11. He says, remember at that time, you Gentiles, he says, in the flesh. Now, he calls us Gentiles. If you're not Jewish today, 
in a very broad category, you're a Gentile. In fact, the word just speaks of a, a nation. It speaks of a Gentile. If you don't have Jewish lineage, you're a Gentile. Sometimes we just would refer to that in the scripture as pagans. It would be a reference in a very broad view of any non-Jew. And so look at it again in 2.11. You're Gentiles in the flesh. He's just saying, as Paul, is you were a Gentile by birth. And to a Jewish person, and we'll get into this next week, a Gentile was an outcast. They were an outcast uh, in every way socially, but just even an outcast physically. William Barclay kind of helps us feel the alienation and the deep-seated hostility, and he would even use the word contempt between them, especially on the Jewish side. Here's what the, the Gentiles said the Jews. The Jews believe this, it's in print, that the Gentiles were created by God to be fuel for the fire of hell. In other words, there came to be such a breach uh, of a lack of harmony, a lack of unity, that there was a number of Jewish people who just said they were created, the Gentile people, to be fuel for the fire of hell. God, they said, loves only Israel of all the nations that he has made. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, it was not even lawful to help a Gentile mother in her hour of need, for that would simply bring another Gentile into the world. You have to understand the hostility, and I think we've seen nothing of this type of hostility even in the 21st century. In fact, until Christ, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. The barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, or a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of the Jewish boy or girl was carried out. I mean, these people never could see anything together. In fact, contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. In fact, do you remember even in biblical times, when a Jew entered Palestine, he would shake off the dust from his, what? Sandals. They just didn't want to even be contaminated with Gentile dirt. And so here, he says to us, remember, he says, you were alienated physically. You say, how so? Look at it in 2.11. He said there that you were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. In other words, if you're a Gentile, you are called uncircumcised. In other words, your very body, if you will, proclaimed really a pagan identity. Circumcision, I think, as you know, was the distinguishing mark, at least externally, that people or that Israel belonged to God's people. It was actually even a seal that God had made or spoken with the Jews through Abraham, Genesis chapter 17. All males would be circumcised. Circumcision was the removal of the male foreskin in obedience to the command God gave to Abraham, Genesis 17. You, you say, what was, the, what was this external sign? Well, it pointed to an exclusive relationship which Israel had with God of the covenant. In other words, it was a sign of their covenant. Beloved, do you remember even the phrasing when David came out to meet Goliath in that battle? And he said, who, finish the statement, is this un, what? Circumcised Philistine. Who in the world is he, an uncircumcised Philistine to taunt the armies of the living God. In other words, Gentiles were outside of the covenant. They were uncircumcised, if you will. They were not set apart 
by God. You say, how deep was the growing hostility between Jew and Gentile? Well, certainly you can go back and listen to that online. Just think of Jonah when God called him to go preach to Nineveh, the prophet ran in the opposite direction. After he finally obeyed the Lord and preached, and the whole city, what did they do? They repented. It says in the text that it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Do you remember that? He says, I want you to, I want you to go preach here, and rather than going east, he goes to Joppa, he boards a boat, and he goes as far as west he can go on the face of the earth on the Mediterranean Sea. So God throws him overboard, you know the account. He's swallowed up by a great big fish. The fish spits him out here to the Ninevites, and he went and preached to them, and they got saved. I mean, it would be an evangelist dreams dream, and he becomes angry, and here's why. Because God had compassion and spared the wicked Gentiles of Nineveh, just as Jonah knew that God would do if, he, if they repented. But, but you, you want to see this, though, just for a second here. They didn't have what was set up to be a mark of the covenant. But to the Jewish people, it became so much more than what God had meant in fact, look at the text again. He said, call the uncircumcision, and Paul's got to be a little sarcastic here, by what is called the circumcision, and then this phrase, which is made in the flesh by hands. In other words, circumcision, as you know, had become exaggerated. In other words, it wasn't really a distinguishing mark of God on the heart, Paul is just saying here it became done by the hand and he's being sarcastic. In other words, you Gentiles were alienated physically because you did not have the right of passage to God. But to you Jews, your pride was manifested religiously that was merely an external and a superficial thing. And you remember the Jewish nation was to be a light to the Gentile nation. And what happened over time is they became so hostile to each other, you wouldn't even help a woman in pregnancy because it would bring another Gentile um, into this earth. In fact, I don't have time to go into Acts 15. Do you remember when they were trying to make these Gentile converts take some of the things of the Jewish ritual laws? We'll talk on that next week before they could become a Christian. And remember, Peter and the others had to put that down. In fact, I have this in Colossians. Bring this up. In him, here's the true circumcision. You were circumcised with a circumcision, see that phrase? Made without hands. In other words, true circumcision isn't just external, but it's the putting off of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And what is that? Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. True circumcision takes place in the heart. It's not just something physically done. In fact, look at Romans 2, even the next scripture. This, for no one is a Jew who is, one merely, is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. But he begins this, and he, he tells us to remember that you at least at one point were alienated physically. But he goes on here under this first word to say, secondly, you were alienated spiritually. And this is really where Paul's argument is going. And what he does is he lists five Gentile deficiencies, spiritually speaking. In other words, don't forget what the Lord redeemed you out of. You were not part of the promises of Israel. You were on the outside. You didn't even bear, if you will, the mark of the covenant, 
though it was greatly exaggerated. You say, well, what are these deficiencies, spiritually speaking, that you need to be reminded of today? Well, there's five of them. Number one, remember you were Christless. Look at verse 12. Remember you were Christless. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Now listen, you've got to enter into that if you're a believer here. There, there was a time that myself, as a Greek, okay, were separated from Christ. How utterly sad. You were without a Savior. You were at one time spiritually alienated because you had no deliverer. You were literally severed from Christ, alienated, cut off from the Messiah, excluded, if you will, from the life and the promises that came to Israel first. In fact, the Jews had the promise of the coming of the Messiah, remember, all the way back to Genesis 3.15. The prophets then, out of the Jewish scripture, foretold of the coming of Christ. But listen, if you're here and you're a believer, you need to remember that you were Christless at one time, right? You have to be born again. And if, you're, if you've come into faith, then you're grateful. But there was a time, I think Paul's saying, here, you were alienated spiritually. You need to remember that you were Christless. But secondly, you need to remember that you were on the blacklist. Look at it in verse 12. You were on the blacklist. It says in 12, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, alienated from the chosen people of God. In other words, if you're a Gentile and you're not a descendant of Abraham physically or Isaac or Jacob or you didn't grow up believing in the one true God, and you didn't grow up understanding the law of God, if you didn't grow up in one sense that they were God's elect nation, now we know that not all Israel is truly saved, but they were the ones that had the truth come to them. You remember back in the Old Testament, they were a theocracy under the nation of God. God was their king. God was their Lord. God made himself known to the Jewish people. And you, if you're non-Jewish, you were alienated from all of that. So you have to remember you were Christless, that you were on the blacklist. Thirdly, let me say this, you were homeless, spiritually speaking. Homeless. Look at the phrase again. Strangers to the covenants of promise. In other words, you were not only alienated, but you're a stranger, and you were a stranger to the, I like that phrase, the covenants of promise. In other words, if you're not Jewish, you had no blessing, no promises given to you. You had no home. In fact, you know, if you look and write down later in Romans 3, 2, the Jews, the Jewish nation, was entrusted with the very oracles of God. In fact, as he describes being homeless there, he says, you're strangers to the covenants of promise. A covenant of promise was a commitment, beloved, of the triune God and his people where he by he would carry out his eternal decree of redemption. Now, he mentions here covenants, plural, and it could be that there's the Abraham covenant. He made a covenant to Isaac, to Jacob, the Mosaic covenant. But I really think that he's speaking here of the Abrahamic covenant with all the blessings that would come or were supposed to come through that nation, if you will, to all nations. I think certainly he's speaking here of the new covenant. And so he says, you are a stranger to all of that. Listen, I don't know what you're thinking as you walk in today, but this is the point apart from Christ. And I don't think Paul is trying to exhort you and be mean, 
I just think he's trying to tell us, hey, remember. Remember you were grafted in. Remember you were brought to Christ. You used to once be Christless. You used to once be on the blacklist. You used to once be homeless. And then it says the promise of the covenants. Look at this text in Romans chapter 9 in verse 4. They are Israelites, and we understand this. And to them, at least initially, right, belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong all the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, here's the promise, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. I think we understand all those things came initially to the Jewish nation, to those who actually believed in him, he promised eternal life. God promised to bless them. God promised to multiply them. God promised to redeem them. God promised to give them a land. He promised to give them a priesthood. He promised to give them a people. He promised to give them a nation. He gave them a king. He gave them a kingdom. He said all the families of the earth will be one day, New Testament, blessed through you. But he wants to say again to us, just to remind us that you Gentiles were Christless. You were on the blacklist. You were homeless because you had no promises. And fourthly, he says, I want you to remember, look at verse 12, you were hopeless. Look at verse 12. He says there, towards the end, having no hope. In other words, you were without a savior. You were without a home. You were without a promise. And because you had no promise, you had no hope. And the question would be begged is, can you imagine living with no hope? And the truth is, sure you can, because at one point, you weren't part of this covenant. So I can remember that distinctively. I can remember as a teenager having no hope. I can remember my life as a 14-year-old being afraid to cross the street because I thought I was going to die. I can remember having no promise of eternal life. I can remember having no assurance if I died, what would happen. I was living, I thought I was really living, but I was living without any hope in the world. And this is the way most of our people live. And he's asked you to be salt and light. But listen, you can't forget who you are and where you came from. And if there's any pride in your heart, that's why Paul's addressing this to us. He's trying to address to us the great theme of reconciliation and unity. How could we ever therefore not be unified with someone in our family? Or someone in the body of Christ? Or some extended believer because look at what he's done for you. You used to be without hope. There was a social Darwinist. His name was, you probably heard of him, Herbert, Herbert, Herbert Spencer. He wrote this, quote, he said, my own feeling respecting the ultimate mystery, and I think he's talking death there, is such that I cannot even try to think of it without some feeling of terror so that I habitually shun the thought. In other words, he didn't know how to think about death. So listen, I just, I just put it out of my mind and out of my heart. That's living with no hope. That's being Christless, on the blacklist, homeless, and, and, and if you will, having no hope. You know, I read something this week, it's just hard to believe, and maybe you've heard this, is that suicide as a thought as a reality for some, claimed more Japanese lives in October than 10 months of COVID. Do we ever talk about that? It claimed more lives in Japan in October than 10 months of COVID in Japan. 
Far more Japanese people are dying of suicide, exacerbated by the economic and social repercussions of the the pandemic than of COVID-19 itself. In fact, the article went on to say that Japan has managed its coronavirus epidemic far better than many nations, keeping deaths, this is back in October and November, below 2,000 nationwide. But statistics from the police agency show that suicides surged to 2,000 153 in October alone. You you talk about living in a hopeless world, we're living in it. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's brought you from far off to near, you ought to walk out of this place so thankful that he redeemed you. In fact, to date, at least in this article in November, more than 17, <coughs> excuse me, more than 17,000 people have taken their own lives this year in Japan, looking back. Hopelessness sets in. You say, why? Ignorant of salvation? No hope. Think about it. Beyond this world, no savior, no resurrection, no eternal life, nothing to anticipate, nothing to look forward to. So he says, remember, you were Christless on the blacklist, homeless. You were, you were homeless and hopeless. And then there's one final one. Look at it at the end of 12. He says, you were without, do you see that one? Verse 12, without God in the world. It's interesting. It says without God. It's the Greek word atheo. And it's the word that we get atheism from. He says, fifthly, you need to remember you were godless because you were without God in the world. What he means here is not that they're all atheists, but they didn't know the true God. Oh, in fact, they worshipped Artemis. I told you that at the beginning, the worship of this gross pagan deity. They had many gods. In fact, they had so many gods Did the Gentile world in Acts 17.22 they had an idol to the inscription, and you know the phrase, to the unknown what? God. They had so many gods that they had an inscription to one that they didn't even have named. What Paul means here is that they were alienated from the life of God. You Gentiles were left to interpret life's trials without an understanding of the true God. You were without hope, because you were without the true God in this world. And all at the same time, according to Romans 1.20, without excuse. Without excuse, Calvin said, and how true it is of the day that we live in. John Calvin, the great reformer, said that in the heart of man is an idol factory. That's, what, that, that's what's in the heart of man, is an idol factory. So he said, you're alienated physically, number one. Secondly, more importantly, not just because of circumcision, you're alienated spiritually. So you ask, how did I go from Christless on the blacklist, homeless, hopeless, godless? How did I go from far off? I mean, what kind of resume did you give to God for him to hire you, if you will? You might ask, how did that all change? Let me take you from alienation real quick here to reconciliation. Look at verse 13. But now, I love that phrase, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, look what it says, have been brought near by what? The blood of Jesus Christ. You say, how did God accomplish this? How did he bring two warring parties together? How do two families who don't get along come together? What is it going to take to make a reconciliation? And here, biblical reconciliation says that you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you see that phrase there? You don't want to miss it. I won't labor on it. But now in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's through our union with him. It's through our relationship with him. In fact, if you go back just to chapter one, just for a second, look back there. 
he says that he chose us in him, verse 4. Verse 3, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. It says in verse 5, he predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have the redemption through his blood. All of it comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. You who were once, this is your life, far off, have been brought near, brought to Christ, brought to hope. You say, how? Well, it's there by the blood of Christ. Beloved, his life, it's not just talking about the, the blood, if you will, and his humanness, but life itself is the thought, was violently and sacrificially achieved on your behalf. You say, well, why is the blood so significant? Well, if you just answer the question, what alienates you from God? The answer would be sin. What alienates you from each other? The answer is sin. And the cross and the shed blood is the instrument that brings us back to a reconciled relationship to God vertically and a reconciled relationship to each other horizontally. And so it says there that he shed his blood. Look back at Ephesians 1.7. In him, he speaks of a similar word. We have redemption through his blood. And why is it redemption and why is it reconciliation? 1.7, we have the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So, beloved, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by religious ritual. No, we're saved by the precious blood of the Lamb. And here's what Paul's saying specifically. You who were far off, that's the Gentiles in Isaiah 57, 19, have been brought near. In other words, I took in the marvelous plan of God, God saying in his word, you who were far off, and I've brought you near by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. You have went from being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, verse 12, to present fellow citizens with all the saints. Unbelievable. You now have, as a Gentile, verse 18 of chapter 2, access to God. You went from verse 12, being strangers to the covenants of promise, homeless, to verse 19, no longer strangers and aliens. You know, let me just say this to you. It's unbelievable to me that he's put us together in the local church. Far from the local church not being essential, he's taken you and redeemed you from eternity past, brought you near, and took you from being homeless to no longer strangers and aliens, from having no hope and without God in this world, to members now of God's household. Can you fathom that? You're a member of his household. You went from being far off to brought near. Let me say it another way. The double alienation you faced because of sin has now been reversed by Jesus Christ so that by virtue of your relationship with him, Christ now, in Christ, you've now received a double reconciliation, both vertically and horizontally with one another. And so listen, beloved, remember your sin. Remember your amazing grace of your blood-soaked but now risen and exalted Savior to give you harmony in your home, to give you peace in our home. There's nothing that breaks God's heart more than for there to be disunity in the body of Christ as well. Listen, that blood that removes the stain of your sin also removes the stigma of your separation, and it brings unity to us. Listen, the end of the world's, how do you end the world's domestic violence? 
how do you end the, the world's war? How do you end pandemic and all the things associated with it? How do you end all the world's problems? I have the answer. It is Jesus Christ and him crucified. His shed blood for you. You say, well, pastor, I, I just live in a difficult home. Maybe. But because of what he's done for you and because of what he pulled you out of and because of how he rescued you, you've had the forgiveness of all your sins. He brings peace vertically. He brings peace horizontally. That is what Christ has done. You say, well, well, what else happens that he brought us near? Come back next week and we'll examine those particulars together in 2, 14 through 18. Would you bow your head with me?